Uh, tonight, it actually has a title up there. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, the title is Religious Diversity, Dissent and Democracy. And it's being presented by Professor Carolyn Evans, who is the Harrison Moore Professor of Law and Dean of the Melbourne Law School. I'm really very grateful for Carolyn for agreeing to do this. Uh, at any time, the duties of Dean are hugely uh, time consuming. Uh, but now, with discussion of significant uh, changes to the university, they're obviously <coughs> much more so, and I gather they've been particularly horrendous these last couple of weeks. Uh, but I'm, I'm not only uh, grateful, uh, I'm honoured uh, that she's part of this series. Uh, after graduating in arts and law from Melbourne University, Carolyn worked for a time as a lawyer at Blake Dawson Waldron. And uh, from Oxford, she received uh, a, a doctorate. She went there as a Rhodes Scholar, and she spent there uh, for two years a stipendiary lectureship uh, before she returned to Melbourne in 2000. And in 2010, she was uh, awarded another great honour, a Fulbright Senior Scholarship, to allow her to travel as a visiting fellow at American and Emory Universities to, to uh, sorry, to America and Emory Universities to examine questions of comparative religious freedom. She's the author of Religious Freedom Under the European Court of Human <coughs> Rights and co-author of Australian Bills of Rights, the Law of the Victorian Charter, <coughs> excuse me, and the ACT Human Rights Act. She's co-editor uh, of Religion and International Law, Mixed Blessings, Laws, Religions and Women's Rights in the Asia Pacific Region, and Law and Religion in Historical and Theoretical Perspective. And in 2012, she published Legal Protection of Religious Freedom in Australia, a book that I highly recommend uh, to you uh, as essential reading on this topic, uh, and this topic, a topic that uh, I'm sure will become ever more important uh, and I fear ever more volatile. Uh, Carolyn's an internationally recognised expert on religious freedom and the relationship between law and religion. And she's spoken on these topics in the United States, United Kingdom, Russia, China, Greece, Vietnam, India, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Malaysia, Nepal, and of course, Australia. And so I ask you to welcome Carolyn. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for that introduction, Ray. It's a great honour to be part of this lecture series, which is such an important part of Melbourne intellectual life, uh, and it was extraordinarily generous of Ray to invite me to be part of it. Uh, may I join with him in acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects also to their elders past and present. Could I also just make a, a brief acknowledgement? I realise that part of the fun of this series is normally after the lecture, having a bit of an informal to and fro with the lecturer. Uh, I combine uh, being the dean with being a mother, and last week my son said to me, oh, and you know that we've got our school concert on Wednesday, don't you? <laughs> no, darling, I didn't know that. Uh, so I'm going to have to fly out of here after the lecture, and please don't take that uh, amiss, or in any way try not to engage in a democratic or dissent-oriented discussion. We live in a time of transition with respect to the legal, political, cultural and economic significance of religion in many established Western democracies. Countries which have been relatively religiously homogenous or have had long established compromises between relatively small numbers of religious groups, Catholic and Protestant, Christian and Jewish minority, for example, are increasingly finding established ways eroding. The old verities are challenged and the new normal has not yet had a chance to establish itself. Migration has, of course, played a serious and significant role in creating more religiously diverse liberal democracies, as has the greater ease with which both people and ideas can now transcend boundaries. But there are other phenomena that are changing the religious normal as well. Many who might describe themselves as nominally belonging to one of the mainstream religions commonly now no longer practice in quite the same way as their forebears did. They may not participate uh, as regularly in formal religious practice and they may not be as accepting of all of the teaching rules and values of those religions. 
more have adopted a spiritual position uh, which dissociates itself deliberately from religion or religious institutions as such, uh, but still has some connection to the transcendent uh, and to things that we might normally think of as religious. Perhaps most significantly, the number of people who reject religion altogether is growing in both absolute terms and as a percentage of the population in most religious countries. Some do so with hostility towards religion, others with indifference, and still others perhaps uh, with disinterested benevolence towards those who are religious. But by most educated estimations, in the next census in Australia, the category no religion will be for the first time the largest category of religions in Australia, replacing Catholicism. As is often the case during times of change, there can be increased tensions as a series of matters which were once considered settled and self-evident become disrupted and contested. Each side in modern religious disputes, I think interestingly, can see itself as the victim. I and my people acting entirely in good faith, entirely within the traditions of this country, entirely within the human rights understanding, are behaving properly, and they and their group are entirely oppressive, venal, viciously motivated, uh, and working outside a human rights construct. Try blogging or speaking, as I am uh, doing tonight, on any matter religious, and see how quickly opposing sides organise themselves around polar opposites. Nuance, complexity, sophistication, sometimes even just common sense, can be lost in such debates, with what might have once been seen as relatively low stakes issues in some senses taking on a symbolism which vests them with more importance than they might have had at other historical points. Well, what's a democracy to do in such a time? Liberal democracy must allow for diversity. It must allow for dissent, even or perhaps especially on really critical matters, really divisive matters like religion. If it doesn't, its claims to both liberality and democracy are patently false. But at some point, perhaps, at some point, dissent becomes so toxic and causes so much conflict. Or diversity forces together people of such very different and deeply incompatible worldviews that there's a danger to the reasonable degree of stability and coherence and sense of community that is required for a society to function at all to be threatened. Uh, and some discussion that we've seen in recent weeks about, for example, people travelling overseas to fight for various Islamist groups has raised, I think this is a possibility and a concern, and it's a discussion and a debate I'm not sure that we know how to have yet in this country. Now, let me say up front, I don't think Australia is at the point where we need to worry about the social fabric and social cohesion being deeply disrupted. But the rise in the number of laws and cases around religion and its proper place in society is an indication that the difficulties that we're experiencing as society is changing and with increased religious diversity and debate over matters religious can no longer simply be accommodated by an each to his own solution or simply doing things the way that we've always done them. Rather, we're required to come to grips in our legal and our political institutions with worldviews and values that are deeply at odds with each other while also being sincerely held. And courts and parliaments around the world are struggling with this. They're struggling to come to grips with the complexities that result. Human rights, we're too often referred to, this is the solution, let's just use a human rights framework. It's not an easy or convenient solution to these problems. Religious freedom can be in tension with equality. Free speech can be in tension with religious freedom. All of these, religious freedom, free speech, equality, non-discrimination, they're all fundamental tenets of liberal democratic societies. They're all in the international human rights treaties. They're all in treaties that have, uh, in constitutions or bills of rights. And compromises between these different sets of values, all of which still have social salience, all of which still have their strong supporters, can be seen by each side as a fundamental betrayal of our social underpinnings and indeed of human rights itself. Over the last couple of weeks, as I referred to initially, some of these issues have been discussed in a very high stakes, very emotive context, but that one that frankly affects a relatively small number of people. It's not the stuff of day-to-day -day life. In some ways, I want to say with my lecture tonight, 
the, the more difficult uh, and the trickier things are the ones that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to talk about two of them. Now, I'll start with an admission. I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I've been reliably informed that such are necessary for our society. And I'm going to talk about legal issues as a result. Uh, but I want to, I'm, I'm going to try very hard to avoid you know, getting into to the legal detail and having to come back into that in questions. I want to say instead that the legal responses to these questions are not simply a technical matter, are not simply a legal matter, but a question of fundamental values. I'm going to look at two case studies and try and flesh out a little bit some of the complexities here. The first is about uh, religious employers and the extent to which religious employers should have autonomy about the employees that they choose. And the second is about the issue of religious vilification and religious defamation laws. And in each case, we see playing out the tensions about the competing claims of the appropriate role of religion when it comes into conflict with other values and contestation about the role that should be played by the democratic state and its institutions, courts, tribunals, legislatures, and so forth. So let me start with the example of religious employment, because this is one of the places where these tensions and the attempts at compromise play out in a particularly stark way. The courts are returned to in order to resolve conflicts. Uh, and there are a number of different types of conflicts that arise. Uh, one that's arisen a number of times in the UK recently, for example, is around secular workplaces that put limitations on what religious employees can wear or do in the workplace. So uh, a Christian nurse who wanted to wear a crucifix on a necklace, an airline employee who wanted to wear a badge that was a, as a crucifix uh, and weren't permitted to. I'm going to leave those cases to one side. I'm, I'm happy to come back to them in question time. I'm going to focus on a second set of cases which are about religious institutions and organisations as employers. Think your religious schools, hospitals, welfare agencies and so forth, of course, and also uh, the religious bodies directly themselves, employees directly of the Catholic Church uh, of a particular synagogue, for example. I'm going to deal with the claim that they should be permitted to select their employees with reference to their religious values. And that might mean that they be permitted to discriminate in the legal sense against employees or potential employees on a range of grounds, including religion. We should be able to choose co-religionists or at least people whose religious world values are sufficiently similar to ours on the basis of sex. This role, this role as a ministry is just for a man, for example. Marital status and sexuality. We don't want somebody who's gay employed in this institution. Now, it might be helpful in doing this to consider three different approaches that laws in various liberal democracies have taken to dealing with such cases. The first is to treat religious employers just like any other employer, subject to exactly the same rules. And I'm going to call that first approach the ordinary law approach. The second is to give a special status to religious employers, at least in some circumstances, to allow them not to have to apply the ordinary law. We'll call that the immunity approach. And the third approach is one which balances the competing claims of religious freedom and employee rights, and I will imaginatively call that the balancing approach. So let me start with the ordinary law approach. The ordinary law approach is the one that I think many Australians expect. That is, religious employers have to obey the same laws of all other similarly situated employers. It's the one that's most concerning to religious groups that value their autonomy and most commonly proposed by those who are concerned about improper religious influence or privilege. In many areas of legal regulation, this is, of course, the obvious and uncontested approach. Uh, when it comes to the sorts of uh, buildings that are allowed to be occupied, the same ordinary approach comes in terms of, uh, of safety laws, environmental standards, criminal law and so forth. But in the employment area, this is a much more contested approach. It should be noted that such an approach would not leave religions entirely without some capacity to make arguments, at least, that in particular cases there should be uh, limits on their obligation to comply with non-discrimination law. Most anti-discrimination regimes have some sort of equivalent of a genuine occupational requirement exemption that permits what would otherwise be discrimination if it can be shown that the tray is a genuine or inherent requirement of the job. Uh, thinking of auditioning for 
roles in a play might be perfectly reasonable for the female lead to only be played by a woman. Now, a strong case, for example, would be made that religious affiliation is absolutely essential for religious leadership or ministerial positions. Probably a good case could be made out for traits such as gender or sexual orientation, so far as they're considered by the religion to be essential for those in leadership positions, to also fall into the genuine occupational requirement. So an ordinary law approach would give religions some scope to at least make the case that for a particular employee, it was necessary, or a particular class of employees, it was necessary to have someone of a particular faith, sex, sexual orientation, and so forth. Now, one of the main benefits of this approach is it is relatively straightforward and clear. Employers and employees will generally know where they are because generally the same laws will apply to them as apply to everyone. The area of complication will arise on the boundaries as to what is a genuine and what is not a genuine occupational requirement, but the category is likely to be relatively small. Such an approach places a high value on two understandings of equality. The first is respect for equality of all actual and potential employees from discrimination on the basis of race, sex, sexuality, religion, disability and so forth. It's an easy point for those who see this debate wholly through the lens of religious autonomy, and there are many who do so, to overlook. The non-discrimination commitment is an important one, particularly to those who are vulnerable to discrimination, but also to the wider societies that implement such laws. Creating exemptions, exclusions, special treatment, exceptions to protect religious organisations from the full impact of such laws undermines both their practical and their symbolic importance. Those who approach the debate from a non-discrimination or indeed a standard labour law point of view recognise the potential for wide exceptions to undermine the impact of those laws both in practice and symbolically, laws that have of course been put in place to protect relatively powerless employees. The genuine occupational requirement exception forces religious employers to articulate and justify the necessity of restrictions on certain positions rather than simply assuming them. When religious organisations are substantial employers that play a significant role in certain economic areas, and that is absolutely the case in areas like education uh, and running hospitals in Australia, it becomes even more important to ensure that a large number of employees or potential employees are not left unprotected without very good reason. The general law approach also uh, emphasises another sort of a um, equality, which is economic or competitive equality. It says, well, if a secular employer or a private provider is going to employ, have a hospital or a job agency, and they're bound by all the rules, and there's always going to be a certain cost to complying with those rules and uh, claims that might be made that the rules are breached, and another similarly placed but religious organisation is not bound by those rules, that religious organisation has a competitive or an economic advantage. Now, I don't think that's a decisive argument. Now, when fundamental human rights are at stake, that's not going to be a game changer. But it is one that I think it is worth uh, simply noting, uh, in part to remember that there are reasons other than simply religious reasons that one might want to claim some degree of exemption. Now, despite these advantages, there are several problems with relying solely on the general law approach to manage relationships between religious employers and religious employees. The most salient of these is it will generally require a secular court, tribunal, anti-discrimination commission to make determinations as to what constitutes a genuine occupational requirement. And this critically is an area for substantive values-based disagreement. Let me give you an example from a case in Australia that shows up some of the complexities here. It involves a, a Miss Walsh. Uh, she'd been a long-term member of the St Vincent de Paul Society, and many of you may be aware the St Vincent de Paul Society is a Catholic organisation which combines, uh, as its, its predominant approach, a lot of good works in the community, uh, think of Ozum House, various uh, soup vans and so forth, uh, with uh, a religious dimension. So Ms Walsh, who's Christian but not Catholic, has been a member of the society for a long time and she becomes the president of St Vincent de Paul Society in Queensland. And then it becomes clear to the, the, the powers that be that she's not Catholic and she's forced to resign. She goes to the Anti-Discrimination Tribunal of Queensland and says, I want, I want my position back. This was blatant discrimination. I'm being turfed out on the basis that I'm not Catholic. <laughs> 
There was no contestation about that. No one was pretending it was any other reason. If she'd been Catholic, she would have been absolutely fine. So the court had to say, well, is there a genuine occupational requirement that the person who's the president of the St Vincent de Paul Society is Catholic? And the relevant test has two parts. The first is what they call it an objective determination, whether a reasonable person would see that there was a genuine occupational requirement, and the second was subjectively, could she fill it? Again, the second was of no interest. It was clear if there was a requirement, she wasn't a Catholic, so she'd fail. So the society failed on the first ground. The tribunal held it was possible for a non-Catholic to carry out the functions of president of the conference, even if, all things being equal, it might be desirable uh, for a Catholic to do so. The fact that the president of St Vincent Paul Society did have some limited religious obligations, reading out uh, prayers at the start of a meeting, for example, didn't mean that her duties involved religious practices or observances. And it should be noted that the tribunal held this despite evidence of several eminent Catholic theologians to the contrary. The decision that had to be made ultimately required the decision maker to make a value judgment. It's disguised in the language of objectivity and legal tests and so forth. But it is not straightforward to evaluate the importance of religion in roles that combine religious and secular functions. Moreover, in this case, the applicant, being Christian but not Catholic, wasn't anti-religious, wasn't non-religious. She shared a lot of the same beliefs. For a secular tribunal to determine exactly what type of religiosity might be required is even more complicated than deciding some type of religious commitment is required. And in this case, just to throw an extra level of complexity, of course, the St Vincent de Paul Society had had her acting in the role of president for some time. She'd been very involved in the society for some time uh, with no apparent problems. So it's always going to be harder to say, yeah, it's absolutely essential that this person have this characteristic uh, when you're happy to employ people without it when convenient. Now, for those concerned with religious autonomy, a particular worry about this process was that non-discrimination tribunals or labour courts or other tribunals will ultimately be determined to be perceived uh, by many people who are religiously committed, those, those bodies will often be seen as more committed to the secular, to the non-discrimination, to the general principles of labour law, and they'll have little or no understanding, sometimes no sympathy and sometimes outright hostility to religious sensibilities, teachings or beliefs. Now, whether that is demonstrably true or not will differ from tribunal courts and differ between different jurisdictions. Uh, but it is certainly a perception. It's probably reasonable to believe that a court or tribunal which is established with its main role as being the protection of people from non-discrimination or the upholding of standard labour law is likely to have members with a greater understanding and sympathy towards that worldview than those uh, who seek to promote the protection of religious authority. Finally, on this, on this first approach, the general law approach excludes at least one type of religious employer by making it effectively impossible to create an organisation on any scale that just hires co-religionists. Religious organisations and religious individuals commonly reject the distinction that some types of roles are important and special and they fall into genuine occupational requirements. A minister or a school principal might need to be religious, but everybody else doesn't matter. They argue they wish to create an environment in which all employees share the same values and communicate them in a coherent and effective way to each other and to others. Such arguments are put particularly strongly in an organisation such as a school, and schools have been a real flashpoint for this in Australia. They say that every member of staff, not just those teaching religion, but the school secretary, the, the gardener, the cleaner, the person who works in the canteen, that all of these people collectively make up the religious community. All of them convey the values of the religion by the way they carry out their role, uh, and that therefore all of them need to share the religious ethos of the school in order to undermine, uh, underline and communicate the importance of those values to students. So that's the first approach, the ordinary law approach. Let me turn then to its polar opposite, the immunity approach. This is one that carves out either some or all roles from the usual protection of labour uh, and non-discrimination laws. The most common example is what's called the ministerial exception rule, that in some legal systems leaves the employment of ministers and the dismissal of ministers 
as effectively a matter solely governed by the rules and processes of the religious organisation involved. The organisation doesn't have to prove anything other than that the person is a minister for the purposes of the exemption. If they're a minister, it's effectively a law-free zone. It doesn't have to show that there was compliance with the teaching of the religion when they, for example, sacked the person, that they behaved reasonably, even that there was an absence of malice or that there was some proper due process, anything at all. The courts just have no role other than determining this person, this group, this class of employees falls within the exemption. And a number of advocates for religious organisations have made it clear that they would like to see a very widespread application of this sort of rule to religious employees of many kinds, not simply ministers, while others are, of course, concerned at any exemption at all, even potentially including ministers. Now, the immunity approach, of course, doesn't raise the same concerns as the first approach regarding secular interference with core religious decision-making. It creates a zone in which religious people acting communally can live out their faith without state interference, and it's therefore far more protective of religious autonomy than the first option. Once the boundary line is set as to what is protected by the immunity and what is not set, it becomes a relatively simple test, but for the opposite reason for the first one. In the first one, it's relatively simple because pretty much everyone is protected by the law. In the second one, it's pretty simple because pretty much nobody is protected. So with the first approach, it has the virtue of being relatively clear, uh, but of course, has some other problems. Now, a recent case from the United States Supreme Court, the Hosanna Tabor case, illustrates the immunity approach with respect to ministers. Uh, the petitioner in this case was the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, which we'll call Hosanna Tabor, which is a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod at the second largest Lutheran denomination in the United States. And the Synod had a school and it classified its teachers into two groups. There were lay teachers, minority, and there were called teachers, most of the teachers in the school. And once called, a teacher has an official title as a Minister of Religion, commissioned, and the functions of these teachers are still predominantly teaching you know, maths and English and science, that's what they do with 90% of their time, but they also lead some prayers, they may teach religious education, uh, and they'd sometimes lead the chapel service. Now, Cheryl Perich, who was a former employee, as a teacher at the school and was a called teacher, she developed a sleep disorder, sleep apnea during, uh, uh, sorry, narcolepsy during her uh, time at the school, and she took, as she was entitled to, sick leave. She then tried to return to school the next year. Uh, the school didn't think she was ready to return to school. She thought that she was. They wanted her to use their dispute settlement processes within the church. Uh, she didn't want to. She just wanted to come back to her job. They terminated her employment. Now, she said her position had been terminated unlawfully because of her illness. This, if it was true, would usually, if they were another sort of employer, be a breach of American uh, legislation which prohibits discrimination on the basis of a disability. The church claimed, no, she was terminated from employment because she wouldn't participate in the church-designated um, conflict resolution. That may also, incidentally, have been an unlawful basis for termination. But more significantly, the church said, look, none of this matters because she's a minister. And because she's a minister, if we want to employ her, we'll employ her. If we want to sack her, we want to sack her. And it's just not any of your business courts to tell us about that. And the Supreme Court agreed. It agreed, in fact, nine judges uh, at, with none on the other side. Quite a surprising result in such a contentious case. And those judges said that the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which prohibits establishment and protects freedom of religion, required that the determination of who was sacked and who was employed as a minister was solely a matter for a religious organisation. Let me read you a little bit from what the court said. The members of a religious group put their faith in the hands of their ministers. Requiring a church to accept or maintain an unwanted minister or punishing a church for failing to do so intrudes on more than a mere employment decision. Such action interferes with the internal governance of the church, depriving the church of its control over the selection of those who will personify its beliefs. Now, the court, in addition to this, had a fairly wide definition of what a minister was for constitutional purposes. It didn't limit it to a traditional head of a congregation, as you can see, because we're talking about a teacher in this case. The approach, as illustrated in the case, raises a number of complex issues. 
The first is how you're going to determine where the boundary line is. And you're still probably going to have, somebody's going to have to determine who's a minister and who's not a minister. Now, either the secular courts get pretty involved in this, and this raises the whole question again, is that appropriate? Are the courts the right body? Do they have the right understanding? Or you do what the court did in this case, which is by and large leave it in the hands of the religious organisation. How did they define it? How did the employee, in this case, she described herself as a minister at various times. Now, when the determination's in the hands of the secular authority, there are going to be definitional disputes and rooms for disagreement. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward, it looks like a straightforward test historically, who's a minister in a society where you've got a clear hierarchy, priest, bishop, monks, largely full-time, largely professional people in ministerial roles, they wear different clothes, they live different lives, so, yeah, they're, they're people who are separate. That's yeah, reasonably easy and a relatively small group. But once societies are multi-religious, as most liberal democracies, including our own, are, it becomes much more difficult to draw those lines. Because if you're going to give immunity for ministers in perhaps the established Christian churches with a very uh, clear layer of hierarchies, we have to do it for all the religions, you have to do it for all the churches, and they can have some very different and very complicated leadership lines. So you have to find ways of recognising and protecting a plethora of different religious leadership structures, because otherwise you'll discriminate against some religious groups, but finding a test that's sufficiently inclusive but also sufficiently robust is a very difficult task. And so it's perhaps understandable that the courts do what the court did in Hosanna Tabor and say, we'll leave it to you guys, you tell us who your ministers are. But if the determination of who is a minister is left largely in the hands of religious groups, and if there are substantial legal benefits to having people be ministers, well, there's an incentive for creeping clericalisation. It becomes beneficial for religious employers to inject ministerial aspects into other roles for legal rather than purely religious reasons. And since the Hosanna Tabor case, there have been an enormous number of ministers appearing in workplaces. In 2012 in Kentucky, for example, the, Lexic the Disciples of Christ operated Lexington Theological Seminary dismissed two members of staff and they said they were ministers, and the court said they were ministers, so you know, don't look here for any sort of uh, assistance. What's striking is in that neither case was the appellant actually a member of the religion. Mr Kirby, who was sacked, was a Methodist, and even more extraordinarily, Mr Kant was Jewish. <laughs> uh, there are people who have been determined to be ministers from completely different religions. Uh, Catholic nuns who are excluded from the priesthood, determined to be ministers, uh, for the point of, of this test. So it really does capture a very broad range of people. Now, a second serious concern that arises from this approach is it gives no weight at all to the rights and interests of the employee or the potential employee. Even if we accept that maybe um, you know, there, there might be something to be said for allowing religious values to come in, their treatment can be arbitrary, it can be malicious, it can be discriminatory, and it's not open to scrutiny, even when the connection with religious teaching and the action that was taken is remote. In Hosanna, the teacher was said to not comply with the teachings of the church because she didn't comply with the settlement of dispute provisions. And this is a pretty tenuous, uh, relatively uh, limited connection to religious teaching as it is. But under the tests, the school could have said, she was sick, we didn't want to employ a sick person, and we sacked her. But it's none of your business because she's a minister. And there have been some actually fairly appalling and disturbing cases uh, with people who have been long-term members of religious congregations who've developed uh, very serious illnesses, for example, who have been thrown out of those congregations uh, because they're sick and because the congregations don't wish to pay for their treatment. Courts say don't look here. Now, religious organisations are large employers in areas such as education, health and welfare in Australia, Paradoxically, while the number of people who are associated with religions are declining, the impact and involvement of many religious groups in society is increasing. Uh, an extended immunity <coughs> approach leaves potentially a very substantial number of employees without basic legal, legal protections. Now, a common approach to this, and I've, I've heard this said by uh, many people in this context, is, look, this isn't really an issue. People can just get another job. Uh, people shouldn't have to have every possible job in the world open to them. They can find some other job not subject to the same restriction. Don't work in a Catholic school, go and work in a state school. 
By doing this, they argue, religious freedom is preserved and no real harm is caused to the individual. They just have their range of options slightly reduced. Now, I've always thought that this was a dubious argument. Termination from employment in particular is confronting and hurtful to individuals, and there's no way around that. Being rejected for a job, particularly on the basis of something that you can't and have no desire to change, is also damaging. But of course, as we move now to many economies in many Western democracies, uh, being in a state where unemployment's a very high level, the notion that people can simply get another job becomes an even more questionable response to those who seek employment on a non-discriminatory basis. Let me note in parenthesis that I also hear the same argument made uh, by people who say that religious people just should adapt to circular, secular workplaces entirely or they should go and get another job in uh, another environment. I'm not suggesting their precise moral or legal equivalence, but there certainly can be a good deal of hard-heartedness on both sides of the debate about people who don't fit uh, easily into various types of employment options. Let me turn then to the third and final type of approach we might take to this issue, and that's the rights balancing approach. It balances the competing rights and significant interests of both the employer and the employee. It doesn't accept, as the immunity approach does, that religious autonomy is a primary or has primacy over other rights, uh, but nor does it say it's morally or legally irrelevant. It doesn't say non-discrimination should trump every other type of uh, right or prevail in every situation, but nor is it morally or legally irrelevant. So rather, both religious autonomy and non-discrimination are both rights that need to be taken into account. Uh, and I'll come to some European Court of Human Rights cases which take this approach. Now, the benefit of this approach is that it's nuanced and it does recognise the reality that there are multiple competing claims in play. I'm not suggesting for a moment that means everyone will be happy with the outcome. Uh, absolutely, undoubtedly, one party will be unhappy with the outcome. That's litigation. But each party at least has a chance for their interests to be heard, to be taken seriously and to be taken into account. It is, of course, therefore, unappealing to those who think that religious autonomy is of such significance that it must prevail always over all other considerations. And it's likewise unattractive to those who think non-discrimination is simply non-negotiable. It is, however, generally more appealing to each group than the approach that says we don't take any, uh, pay any attention to your values at all. Now, the balancing approach is arguably the most consistent with the human rights approach as well. There is no recognised absolute hierarchy of human rights within the international human rights system or most domestic legal systems, even if claims are sometimes made by one group or another. I've heard both uh, advocates of religious autonomy and advocates of non-discrimination make the argument to say that particular right uh, has a particular primacy. Each of the immunity and general law approaches effectively gives substantial weight always to one set of rights with little or no consideration for the other rights at stake. But the balancing approach requires all relevant rights to be taken into account rather than dismissed out of hand. Now, before you say, aha, we got to solution number three, this is the end, this is, this is the, uh, the unproblematic solution, there are a number of problems with this approach as well. The first one is somewhat pragmatic, but within law, we actually do need to think about pragmatism. Uh, it's pretty unpredictable. It runs the risk of incoherence. It runs the risk of judgments being made a bit on the gut feeling or the personal preferences of judges or tribunal members. It requires courts to engage fairly directly in value judgment, and there'll always be concerns that courts are inappropriate, ill-equipped to make such judgments, a fear that there'll be a judicial thumb on the scales of difficult decisions. It can leave both employer and an employee unsure about their legal obligations and rights. Now, over time, you, probably, you get a body of case law developing, as is happening in Europe, might help to decide whether balance should fall one way or another. But in any given case, there'll always be a question, are these facts sufficiently different from the one before so that this falls one side or the other of the scales? Now, the difficulty in predicting the outcomes in such cases can be seen in two cases that were handed down on the same day by the European Court of Human Rights, the same chamber, the same judges. The first one was the Obst case. Uh, Michael Obst was the Director of Public Affairs in Europe for the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormon Church. He went to his superior and admitted that he'd been having an extramarital affair and he was immediately dismissed from his position for doing so. 
The decision of the church was ultimately upheld by the German courts and the German constitution gives quite a lot of weight to religious autonomy and, and has a special place in the German constitution. Uh, and then it was upheld by the European Court of Human Rights. The second case was a case of Schuth and Germany. Mr Schuth was an organist in a Catholic church uh, and he was involved in a... He, he left his wife, he became involved in an extramarital affair and the woman with whom he was living became pregnant. This became known. His position likewise terminated on the basis that this breached the teachings of the church. So they seem like two pretty similar cases, two employees of churches which have clear moral teachings against adultery. In each case, the person had... Um, it either became obvious uh, or had admitted to, uh, to having had an extramarital sexual relationship and in each case they were dismissed on the basis of doing so. In both cases, the German court upheld them. But in the case of Ops, the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, the German courts were fine um, and in the, Mr Schuth's case they found that his rights had been violated. I won't go into the reasoning in detail, it was fairly brief, but in Ops, they said, well, why is it that we're going to say that this termination was OK? Well, the first was that the Mormon church had been really clear about what the moral boundaries for employees were. Very upfront, very explicit. There was no doubt but that Mr Ops knew this was against the rules and if he breached the rules, he could be sacked. Moreover, the German court, when they looked at the case, looked at the different factors, the impact it would have on him and his life and his livelihood, uh, as well as looking at the rights of the church. In Schuth, however, it was far less clear. It's clear that extramarital affairs against the teachings of the Catholic Church, but it was far less clear what his employment situation was and how those values played into it. Uh, and the German courts had simply said, this is the business of the Catholic Church, and they didn't look at any of the other factors that might have been in play. Somewhat strangely, the European Court of Human Rights sort of talked about the difficult for an, difficulty of an organist uh, finding employment outside the religious realm, uh, <laughs> roles for secular organists being relatively hard to come by. Now, the Obst and the Schuth case demonstrate, I think, both the strengths and the weaknesses of this approach. On one viewpoint, the fact that two such different cases could lead to completely opposite decisions shows that the courts are capable of making nuanced, context-specific decisions that will sometimes benefit employers, will sometimes benefit employees, and perhaps will encourage everybody to be clearer, more open and more upfront about what the employment situation is. But alternatively, the outcomes of the two cases could be used to illustrate the unpredictability of the rights balancing approach and particularly the extent to which they involve different value judgments that make it possible for a case that's very similar to another to turn on what might seem to be relatively insignificant facts. All right, I'll come back to employment in my conclusion, but let me turn now to my second example. Another complex interaction between religion and human rights has been the debate about whether, and if so, how, the state should deal with forms of expression that subject religions or religious individuals to hate, contempt, ridicule, negative stereotyping. Article 20, paragraph 2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights requires, quote, any advocacy of national, racial or religious hatred that con constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence shall be prohibited by law. So the ICCPR effectively therefore seems to say you should implement laws prohibiting certain types of hate speech, including religious hate speech. Now, I'd argue that 12 months ago, most people wouldn't have known what the situation was in regard to relig uh, race hate laws in Australia. I suspect it's become a lot more famous <laughs> over the last couple of months. Yes, so race hate is prohibited in various ways, both at Commonwealth and at state level. But only a couple of states, including Victoria, have prohibited religious hate speech. Now, these laws have a complicated relationship with both freedom of religion and freedom of expression, although the debate is often portrayed in fairly simple terms. On one hand, the advocacy of hatred against religious minorities can play a significant role in creating conditions in which discrimination, hostility, abuse, and, and its most extreme form, even genocide, can thrive. These are not hypothetical dangers. We've seen them played out numerous times historically, we continue to see them played out today. We 
almost never go to a situation, in fact, I can't think of any situation, where we immediately move to serious abuses, persecution against a group without a build-up over time of a rhetorical justification as to why this group is lesser, not fully human, not fully deserving of the same protections as the rest of the society. Now, sometimes laws that limit the capacity to vilify religion are said to be a threat to religious freedom. I'm going to come back to the ways in which that can be true because I think it can be true in a moment. But I do want to make the point now that they can and do also protect religious freedom. When a minority religious community feels threatened and under attack, the capacity for those individuals to exercise their religious freedom freely and without fear is undermined. Threats, intimidation, religious hate speech may also make it difficult for members of minority groups to speak out on issues of importance to them, <coughs> even limiting their capacity to use speech to stem the hate speech for fear, often for good reason, that doing so, putting their heads above the parapet, will make them the target of abuse, discrimination and violence. How free is a family to practise their religion if they can't take their children to a synagogue, for example, without those children seeing violent and virulent anti-Semitic graffiti or pushing past protesters saying the most vile things? How free is a Muslim woman to comply with what she believes other requirements of her religion to wear her head covered if every time she leaves the house wearing a veil she's subject to derogatory, to threatening, to abusive remarks. Hate speech can reduce religious freedom and it can silence or marginalise some sorts of speech. So when we say people can't engage in a certain sort of speech, hate speech, of course that's a limit on free speech, but it can also be a protection of some sorts of free speech and some sorts of religious practice. However, on the other hand, overly broad enactments of prohibitions of religious hatred may also be pro problematic from the point of view of both religious freedom and free speech. Religious speech itself may constitute a type of religious hatred of a very dangerous kind. It is certainly not unknown for religious leaders to be among those who've whipped up hatred against other religious groups, advocated violence, legitimised discrimination. But there are types of religious speech, and I would argue legitimate religious speech, that can sometimes be caught up in poorly drafted religious hatred laws that create concerns for religious freedom. Within some religious traditions, for example, the denunciation of errors of others' religion and proclamation of the sole truth of the speaker's religion is an important manifestation of religious conviction. Yet particularly if religious hatred laws are drafted in wide terms, and I have to say I don't think the Victorian laws fall into this category, but some uh, other laws do, such speech potentially could be construed as religious hatred. The most controversial case, like Australia, probably the most controversial case in the, the liberal world comes from here in Victoria. Two Christian pastors from a small evangelical church, Catch the Fire Ministries, had a civil complaint brought against them under the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act 2001 for a variety of statements made at a seminar on Islam and in some publication. The statements were extensive, they were wide-ranging, there was a, some contestation about precisely what was said uh, and by whom, but they certainly included the suggestion that in Islam, quote, there's not much value in a woman, that the people we call terrorists, quote, are actually the true Muslims because they've read the Quran and are now practising it, the implication that money is derived from drug sales to sponsor Muslim proselytism, and the argument that Muslims in Australia have doubled their population in seven years because they control the immigration department. Now, the cumulative effect of these statements was held at first instance to constitute religious vilification. The decision was appealed to the Victorian Court of Appeal. Again, I don't want to go into the technicalities. But that decision was overturned, but the Court of Appeal did not itself determine whether the speech was vilifying or not. But there was a particularly problematic feature, I thought, of the decision at first instance, which was the reliance by the tribunal on controversial aspects of Islamic teaching, such as whether Islam was really a religion of peace or really encouraged discrimination against women. And expert evidence was taken on this as to the real nature of, of Islam. Some of the wilder, wilder claims made by the pastors that are taking over the immigration department, they were just demonstrably untrue and clearly inflammatory. It wasn't a matter of debate. There was yeah, there's pretty clear evidence of that. Um, but things like the status and role of women in Islam, for example, is a matter of intense discussion and debate within the Muslim community 
as well as outside. Uh, the case illustrates, I think, the problems that can arise with legislation where judges may be asked to make difficult decisions as to where the acceptable boundaries of robust, maybe hurtful, but still appropriate debate on controversial matters is, and what crosses into the line of creating hate of a kind that may lead to violence, humiliation, discrimination, or other forms of, uh, of harm. Religious hate laws run the risk of cutting short passionate but publicly important debates, including debates that actually probably wouldn't be caught by the legislation, but people restrain themselves from having it for fear of breaching it, sometimes known as the chilling effect of such legislation. People self-censor for fear of litigation. The Catch the Fires litigation took an extraordinary amount of time, money, effort and energy. When speakers, including those both supportive of a particular religion and those deeply critical of a specific religion or religion in general, are fearful about the consequences of speaking their mind, whether it's to say, if you don't believe in my religion, you will go to hell, or whether it's to say, religious people are all superstitious, nonsense uh, talkers who you know, have no intellectual consequence. If you can't have that debate, even if it's difficult, even if it's robust, then important debate on an important social phenomenon is stifled. I want to just also mention an even more problematic approach to protecting religious, religions from offensive expression, which is the development of the notion of the defamation of religion. This concept, which sort of starts from what looks like relatively benign roots, building on uh, human rights notions such as the prohibitions on hate speech, racism and xenophobia, was first put forward to the Commission of Human Rights in 1999 by Pakistan on behalf of the Organisation of Islamic Conference and then again in the General Assembly in 2006 by Azerbaijan also uh, on behalf of the Organisation of Islamic Conference. Uh, and since that time, there have been a lot of non-binding resolutions condemning defamation of religion. It's been controversial. They've only uh, passed narrowly and the United Nations is beginning to pull back on this now. But it's an amorphous concept and resolutions relating to it encompass a number of issues on which there's a high degree of international consensus, strong support in international human rights law, the need to combat discrimination, violence on the basis of religion, uh, intimidation of people, protection of religious sites from attacks. You know, well, so far, so good. But where they become more controversial is when these measures recommend that legal measures be taken to protect the reputation of the religion itself. Uh, and sometimes people mistake religious hate laws in jurisdictions like Victoria for saying that they really should serve the same purpose. So not protecting people, not protecting individuals, but protecting religions and the reputation of religions. So the first resolution, for example, passed by the Human Rights Council expressed concerns that the media was in, uh, inciting intolerance and discrimination towards Islam uh, and any other religions. Uh, it also expressed deep concern at the negative stereotyping of religions and that Islam is frequently and wrongly associated with human rights violations and terrorism. Now, stereotyping of religions, of course, can lead to hostility against followers of a religion. But there's a danger that such protection of religion can protect religions from legitimate questioning, criticism, debate, and let me say, very importantly, internal dissent. Uh, some of the people who tend to be most critical of religions are people within the religions uh, who are themselves experiencing some of the teachings or values in a particular way uh, and want to say that they are problematic. It's, uh, these defamation uh, statements have been criticised by the UN Special Rapporteurs with responsibilities in the area of religion, racism and speech as being overly vague and often providing a justification for laws, uh, including laws that basically amount to blasphemy and apostasy. Uh, it has been used as a justification in a number of Muslim states for effectively religious crimes, blasphemy, heresy, apostasy, and also to protest about Islamophobia, but not other forms of religious hate in non-Muslim countries. Uh, indeed, earlier drafts of the resolution only referred to Islam and only said that hate against Islam was a problem and there was quite some debate about and resistance to reframing it in more religiously neutral terms. Religious hate laws are intended, even if they don't always succeed, to protect religious minorities who are vulnerable from the personal consequences of vilification. The extension beyond hate laws to the concept of defamation of religions, however, 
may be used to shore up the power and authority of religious majorities and their political and religious hierarchies. Uh, and we see that happening in some European countries, for example, where some laws about religious hate have been used, for example, by Catholic majorities to get films banned that they feel uh, portray Catholicism in a mocking or inappropriate light. So by adopting the institutions of international human rights law and aligning some of the language in the defamation of religion resolutions with the language of human rights, those states who developed the concept of defamation of religions have sought to legitimise actions which would otherwise, I think, be patent breaches of human rights, especially freedom of religion and expression. The language of defamation or of the hurt feelings of religious majorities is increasingly being used to justify and legitimate repressive actions. Uh, and again, I say these are not hypothetical problems occurring in many countries in the world. And I think there is and there has been a danger in a number of countries with hate, which have religious hate laws for some groups to assume that that means that that should give them some protection against their religion being criticised, uh, against their values being criticised or mocked or debated or argued about. Uh, and once you extend to that level, that's a really quite dangerous level indeed. I will say, however, uh, there can be hysterical reaction to these laws. In Victoria, for example, laws now been in existence for well over a decade and rarely used. Catch the Fire was the most high profile example, but there've only been a handful of other cases over the years, and most of them have been dismissed out of hand. Some religious minority groups, though, have argued with those laws on the books, they have a greater capacity to bring those who are vilifying them into a reasonable discussion and negotiation that can allow for a much more reasonable solution to be met, uh, as solutions that were never possible in the past. That can be hard to verify. It's not on the public record in the same way that court cases are, but again, I've certainly heard it from a number of such groups. The record certainly doesn't show any widespread abuse or problematic legal overreach in Victoria, and many critics of such laws focus more on hypothetical or theoretical rather than actual practical dangers. Uh, let's be honest, I've probably just done so myself to some degree in this lecture because I do worry about the possibilities of such laws prohibiting religious hate speech to fairly easily slip into laws protecting religion from debate, which I don't think is the best way to deal with the complex situation in which we now find ourselves. So having looked at both religious employers and religious hate speech as just two examples of the tensions that are raised by religious issues in our legal system, I return to the question, well, what's a liberal democracy to do? As this brief discussion has suggested, there's no easy solution. Between the competing claims of religious autonomy and other social values, including non-discrimination, labour law, the protection of those looking for freedom from religion and the interests of those wanting to have speech to, to announce their religious truths as they see it and those who are intimidated and coerced by some religious speech. These are all issues on which people have quite legitimate concerns, uh, but often opposing. In the workplace context, I, I talked you through three examples. They all have their limitation. They will all be considered inappropriate. They will all be considered unworkable by those on one side of the debate or another. Similarly, with respect to religious vilification, there is no easy or universally agreed resolution. Somebody's speech is limited. Somebody's religious freedom has constraints put on it. Despite this tension, governments and courts can't just walk away from their responsibilities to resolve these issues either at a policy level or at application in particular case. The possibility of resolution is further complicated by the point that I began with. We're in a time of transition with respect both to religious belief and the commitment of non-discrimination. Religious belief is declining in most Western democracies, but there are groups that are intensely, perhaps increasingly religious and are very politically and economically effective. There are a diverse range of religions, but an increasing number of people are likely to find themselves as not being religious. And among those who are religious, the degree of religious commitment varies substantially. At the same time, as the religious landscapes grow more complicated, there has also been a fairly rapid but growing commitment to non-discrimination that's reflected in both laws and social attitudes. The relatively rapid transformation of homosexual relationships from ones that were prohibited and punished by the criminal law uh, in the mid-1990s, the state of Tasmania was still 
fighting the federal government, uh, which was uh, over whether uh, sodomy should be criminalised. And now we have a serious debate about whether Australia should allow gay marriage. It's a relatively compressed period of time for such radical social change and such radical change in attitudes. Non-discrimination norms, of course, don't hold universal adherence, but they now have much more widespread social acceptance than they did when the first non-discrimination laws were introduced and were a matter of quite some controversy. Indeed, many religious people are committed to the principles of non-discrimination, often on religious grounds, but even in circumstances where this might bring them into conflict with the teachings of their church. So there's quite a bit of survey evidence to demonstrate, for example, that Australian Catholics uh, take quite a different position to the Catholic hierarchy on issues of non-discrimination. Most Australian Catholics don't think that Catholic institutions should be allowed to discriminate uh, on all sorts of bases. They take quite a different view on Catholic marriage and so forth. So sometimes this debate is portrayed as fairly simple religious people on one side, non-religious people on the other side, religious autonomy people versus equality people. In fact, it's a much more complicated situation than that. Many religious people, uh, including those in some religious hierarchies, being very much in favour of the equality side of the equation. All that means it's a particularly difficult time to create law and policy that appropriately accounts for the range of different worldviews and political commitments. Such positions range from those who are opposed to secular interference of any kind in religious organisations to those who perceive religious organisations as simply superstitious relics playing a spoiler role with respect to the inevitable rise of equality. There are those who see restrictions on religious vilification as an affront to free speech and nothing more, a threat to free society while others don't understand why the law doesn't punish blasphemy or at least protect their religion from mockery or harsh criticism. In such circumstances, politically, some compromise between these competing views tends to be the result in practice. Such compromise may be the best possible outcome in the circumstances, if not the best of all possible worlds from one viewpoint or another. Legislative or judicial approaches will often adopt a portfolio, for example, taking an immunity approach to ministerial positions, a rights balancing approach to direct employees of religions and a general law approach to those who work for religious institutions. Alternatively, some states may use incentives to encourage religious employers to adhere to non-discrimination law, such as access to government funding, rather than forcing legal obligations onto all players. In the religious vilification realm, some protection may be given to religious groups, but with wide exemptions, or with no particular protection may be given, but some groups may be protected under race hate laws. It may be that this is simply a messy interim stage that will ultimately be replaced by a clearer, more coherent set of responses as the relationships between religious freedom, non-discrimination and free speech crystallise over time. I think it's more likely the conflict of values that's manifest will continue for a long time to come and legal systems will continue to shift uneasily between solutions that will invariably be perceived as inappropriate, downright immoral by at least one set of interests in the debate. Let me finish then with a modest uh, and probably unpopular for everybody plea for thoughtful compromise in areas where there are serious and legitimate values in play on both sides of an argument. It is a hard thing to ask someone to see the world from the point of view of someone they see as oppressive or as having completely skewed values. It is a hard thing to consider the way in which our own values and attitudes may play out as oppressive to others. It's easier, it's more comfortable to dismiss opponents as bigots, as bad faith actors, as human rights abusers, as lacking in empathy. Sometimes those claims may, will be true and we shouldn't shy away from making them when they are. But in several cases, there are people who believe themselves to be acting in good faith from pure motives and in line with human rights and other important social values. They don't recognise themselves in caricatures and they tend to become defensive uh, and then sometimes aggressive if subjected to them. And the sad reality is there's a lot of abuse thrown at people on all sides of these debates. Good decisions and ultimately strong societies do not, in my view, emerge easily from emphasising conflict and exaggerating difference but rather by trying to be creative and nuanced in the approaches taken, recognising that the best of all possible worlds may have to wait for a more settled period of time. Thank you.